Okay. So I was just going to do kind of a general overview of what I'm doing to try to reduce input costs on my farm on cotton. Uh, my goal this year going into production, I've been doing a lot of things, is try to take $100 an acre off typical cotton production, kind of across the board on my whole farm. Uh, I will tell you, my, my cotton crop was not great this year, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the stuff I did. Uh, we just had too much rain and too cold a weather. I have heavier ground. Uh, we had checks on cover crop and no cover crop, and it really didn't make a difference. It wasn't a horrible crop. I'm still surviving. If I had had, if I had spent that extra hundred dollars an acre, I think my yield would have been the same, and I'd probably be filing for bankruptcy. So, uh, how do we get this to change? Oh, there it goes. So I'm a third generation cotton farmer in Lee County, Arkansas. Uh, my father unfortunately passed away in 2011, so it's just just me. My mom actually moved back to Little Rock, so it's just me and my wife and my family are the only people left in Lee County. Uh, farm around 6,500 acres, uh, cotton, non-GMO <laughs> corn, all my corn is non-GMO. Uh, I was about 60% non-GMO soybeans this year. I'm gonna be 100% next year because I, I can't get Liberty Beans to yield and I'm getting the premium on non-GMO soybeans, so uh, it's been a big deal. And then I've, I've been growing furrow rice for a couple years and really gonna expand on the furrow irrigated rice. It's been doing really well and uh, fits my operation well. Uh, I'd say the majority of my crops are irrigated about all my own land. Uh, I do lease some pretty rough ground for cheap rent to kind of plant beans on. Actually grew cotton on a bunch of it this year, but but uh, I don't really count on that land. It just kind of helps me spread my equipment costs a little bit. Uh, I have four young children and there's the Reed family, so I've got two five-year-olds. Is that a pointer? Yes, you do. The one right in the center. Right there? Okay. Yeah. Two five-year-olds. A four-year-old and a two-year-old, so. Uh, hey, I'm in age. Yeah, that's our, that's our Christmas card. So. Uh, kind of three things when I'm sitting down going over this. What have I done to reduce input costs? Uh, the three things I would say the most has been going to an almost no-till system with a cover crop. Uh, this year I had a lot of non-GMO or older technology seeds. I'll talk about my reasoning and what I'm doing next year for that. And then using just sound university recommended practices, you know, don't, don't put more fertilizer than we need on it. So I'll just kind of go through these and what, uh, so kind of my system in cotton, especially on the ground, that's a lighter soils where they're in continuous cotton production, you know, 19 out of 20 years, or I'm trying to get it down to eight out of 10 years, do a, do a one in four, one in five year corn rotation on it. Uh, once I, once I get through <coughs> picking the cotton, I'll on the, usually on the bottom end, if we have any ruts, I'll just very lightly hit it with a field cultivator. Then I'll sow uh, cereal rye. This year I did cereal rye and black oats. I grow my own cereal rye. We try to crank the combine down where we get it as clean a sample as we can. We put it in a little bin. Then we just sow it back out with a fertilizer spreader. I've got about $3 an acre in seed, maybe $5 an acre in seed for my cover crop. Uh, then we cover it with a with a Phillips hair. Uh, those are the, they look like half a diamond hair, the prickly chains. I bought one this year and turned it around. Last year I was using a, a three point hitch do all with the boards taken off, but I kept balling up. Uh, so I like the Phillips hair because it gives me enough tillage. It, if I have a high row from ruts or pickers, it kind of knocks down that high row and evens things back out, but it still leaves plenty of row. Uh, in the spring this year, it just got too tall on me. Uh, I was in my non-GMO cotton. I'm using the, the rye to really help with uh, weed control. Uh, so I was letting it grow off real big. Uh, I think it hurt me some this year on the wet year where it got real tall, but I needed it for the for the weed control anyway on the non-GMO. Uh, next spring, I plan on first of April, probably just going in and killing everything. Uh, I got pictures of all this afterwards. And then in the spring, really the only tillage I'm doing other than that, that Phillips hair is in the spring, we run Adam Chapels back there. Uh, same thing he runs, we run this little modified furrow plow to, to kind of pull a furrow for irrigation. And it kind of re, helps redo your beds. Uh, so is that your only bedding? Is yes. You do that? Yes. And what we're seeing with the cover crop once you, you get such good infiltration, like you can drive by my field right now today, the fields I don't have a cover crop will have a little ponding, even with a high bed. We just don't see that where we get the cover crop because we get such 
such good infiltration of water. Uh, so there's a Phillips here. I'm sure y'all seen them parked in the ditches everywhere and behind shops. Nobody really uses them anymore. I bought one for cheap and uh, that's what I'm incorporating my cover crop with. And it's, man, you can do 400 acres a day with a 200 horsepower tractor. It's quick. And like I say, it does enough. I mean, we even had where ends weren't quite rutted real bad, but still had rough, we'd run it two or three times over the ends. And even like I had a field that was kind of hard that had a few ruts, we ran it twice. And it still leaves enough bed uh, <coughs> that, that I feel very comfortable with it. Uh, planting the rye. So this is planting, that's kind of the height I like to plant in two. Uh, it's easier to plant in two when it's green. I think when it gets to that height, if we're not planting, I'm gonna kill it this year. Just cause with cotton, with soybeans or, or corn even, I don't mind going bigger with the cotton. I'm just a little apprehensive, a little bit apprehensive of doing mixes. I like the rye. I know what's going to happen with it. I'm just a little bit apprehensive in cotton with some maybe some allelopathic effects. I don't know, but I, I like the rye. I can sow it in the fall. It does. We're not doing deep gripping anymore. I mean, that's one of my big cost savings. I mean, that's fifteen twenty dollars an acre there. Uh, so we're not doing deep deep tillage. It, it builds soil structure. I mean, you can go out in any of these fields, you're going to get, you know, eight or ten earthworms per scoop. You, you start seeing layers of your soil definition where you're actually building some structure. Uh, I'm going to show a study that we did on our farm where I had cover crop versus no cover crop. So, so the, the, the cereal rye is doing what the deep tillage would do. We're holding, we're, we're getting weed control out of it. We're holding moisture in our soil. We're not getting the erosion, so that's what's what I've really gone for, uh, trying to get pretty much all my cotton acres in cereal rye. Right? That's where it got too tall for me <laughs> with cotton. I mean, we planted into it, we did fine, but it just it's fine when it's like that and it's green. When it gets like that and it turns brown, you're gonna have some sleepless nights. So that's when it started turning brown, and we we actually planted into that and then rolled it behind the planter. It was great on pigweeds. The field ended up yielding pretty well. It was conventional cotton, uh, but uh, and this is our modified Orthman. It's just uh, it's regular old Orthman lister, and we dropped the, where the plow was and, and put these notch coulters. It's almost like planter disc openers, and then behind it have a clean out plow. So it's just making a little trench about that wide. And I mean, I actually like to do it pretty deep, four or five inches deep. And so really, instead of throwing a bed up you're kind of <laughs> putting it down but that's that's really we're getting that's where the only tillage I'm doing so I mean if you look at a conventional farming system where you're, you're after you cut the stalks you're deep ripping it at 15 to 20 dollars then in the spring you're coming back with the orthman at another at least 10 to 12 dollars it's 27 dollars then you're going to run a do all for eight dollars to knock it back down once you just hipped up so that's you know 35 40 dollars and then uh, you're going to run your Orthman to run your plows for you irrigate. So that's another $12. So, you know, you're at $55, $60. Where with this, I mean, 2 or $3 for a Phillips hair in the fall and, you know, whatever, $5 for this thing. So, I mean, your, your, your total tillage bill is, is gone. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like a lot of times, I know I wasn't doing it. When, you're, when tractors have gone from $125,000 to $250,000 for just a regular front wheel assist tractor, it's costing you a lot of money to run that thing. Just in depreciation, beyond diesel, anything. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting about half or less the hours on my tractors than I was. Actually, what I did, I've been expanding my farming operation and have not bought more equipment. So I'm farming 6,500 acres with four tractors and don't really feel like I'm stressed at times. But by, by having everything in the spring ready to go, generally, you can hook four planters up and run. You don't have to have a bunch of tractors rolling and do all and hipping and tilling. You just go. Uh, so this was a, a study Dr. Oosterhouse did on my farm. We'll go through it quick. I, this field had been in continuous cotton with covers for the last five years. I left off 60 rows. I didn't have a cover crop on, but it's basically no-till. I think if we had had a spot that hadn't had covers on it the last five years and had been conventional till, the differences would be even greater. But uh, I did it with America 1511. Uh, so this is, we had a very cold, wet spring. Uh, you can see the cotton there. I mean, you can just barely see it, man. It looked like they poured hot grease on it. 
and this is the cotton in the cover crop. I mean, it was it was up and pretty and, and growing beautiful. And this is very cold. I mean, this was planted, what I say, 15th of April. I mean, it got in the 40s after that. I think it got in the 30s a couple nights. Uh, Nathan? Yes. You know, they used to say that cover crops made it colder in the spring. And you're seeing just... I don't that. think they... I think that, one, when you have that real cold wind, right. you don't get any erosion from uh, sand or any, anything nicking that plant. We've proven that we're not hardly spraying for thrips with right. cover crop. And that's another huge advantage to cover crop and cotton. You just don't spray, you just don't have the thrips issues. Yeah. Uh, that and, and the microbial soil activity that we're seeing. I think, I mean, a lot of times, like I've gone out there with just a little thermometer, a lot of times it'll be warmer in the cover crop. I and mean, don't you see that, Adam? Yeah, we, we did a bunch of yeah. thermometer stuff this spring. It was always in the coldest part of the spring, it was three to five degrees warmer in the cover. And then at the later we got in the spring, uh, the till soil obviously warm up. Right. But when we got in the heat of the summer, the cover crop stayed constant. In the Which that's what I'm fixing to show. Yeah, okay. But it, it's it's in the early spring you get that. I mean, you got living microbes. You've right. got a you've got a growing plant, and even when you kill it, you've got living microbes and the earthworms and everything else that are are actually. So we're seeing quicker. So then they put watermarks in. Uh, so this is at planting, let's see here, 19th of May. So it's a month after planting. Uh, so no cover crop actually was, yeah, it was drier. Cover crop was wetter. When you go down, the wetter it is. So uh, that's at all your different depths. Early May, it really doesn't matter that much. But when you get into July, uh, which we had a very, very wet year. Uh, I watered this field twice, but that's, so this right here, soil moisture at six inches, you can see the cover crop, you can see our irrigation events. Throughout the growing season, we're steadily losing moisture even at six inches. Whereas the cover crop, I mean, you had irrigation or rain events here, but really you draw a line there, you just don't see the, the loss in soil moisture. Uh, and then when you, it really gets more pronounced when you go down to, to 12 inches. Uh, like I say, the lower is the wetter. <laughs> and so, so at 12 inches, I mean, you look at that irrigation event, it, didn't, it did not fully saturate the soil at 12 inches here, and obviously not here, whereas where we had the cover crop, I mean, you had a full saturation. And you think some of that's infiltration? Oh, I know it is, because yeah. it's 12 inches deep. Yeah. It has to be. Uh, that's, and this is your soil tent. So you can see, that's its soil surface. You can see, let's see here, with the cover crop, you're actually, you don't have the high highs and the low lows. See how it's more uniform? And the way that Bill Robertson has kind of explained it is, if you go outside, if you go from this and walk straight outside with sweat, go from 100 degrees to 50 or to 20, and then back in here, you're gonna get sick. Living. Living organisms cannot take that amount of stress. It's not good for them. So, so when you have this, this normalization of temperatures, and that's where I think a little bit the cover crop hurt me in places because here in the fall, you know, throughout the summer, we had such a cold, wet summer. I mean, it, it might have even insulated too much. Uh, but this again is, is soil moisture at six inches. I mean, you can see, uh, right here I mean it started to get dry so right here I mean this really never got to where it would have called for an irrigation whereas where there was no cover obviously that got dry 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 and you can see the irrigation event uh, but even with the water you it, it, you don't get the stress of a plant becoming so dry and then all of a sudden you hit it and shock it back down here and then it gets dry it's it, it's it's more of a uniform uh, Deal. And then this is at 24 inches. So at 24 inches deep, this is the growing season. I mean, we're solid getting rain, the whole growing season, irrigate and everything. At 24 inches deep, it never showed up the soil that, that it was replenishing the soil moisture. So you go here, 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 and right here is probably after peak water usage and the cotton just quit using water and it finally infiltrated down. 24 inches where there's cover crop, look at that. Uh, this is soil, soil temperature, yeah. S soil temperature at six inches. This is cover crop, this is no cover crop. So, 
you can see right here, mm, you have a high, high and low lows where there's no cover crop during around the planting season. And you can see right there where there is a cover crop on that day, you had a higher, the, there was a higher soil temperature where there was a cover crop. So one thing, it does hold heat. Hey, another thing you mentioned on that, uh, I know me and your folks saying less frequency of irrigation because oh, yeah. under 80 degrees, 100% of soil moisture is used for transpiration. You're not losing anything. I mean, you can see at 24 inches, I mean, this right here, I irrigated the field twice at 24 inches. You never would, I mean, you would never, and this was the wettest year I've ever had farming, and we still lost massive soil moisture at 24 inches. With the cover crop, I mean, you can see. Uh, so that's your temperatures. Obviously, and that's where I think I might have got hurt a little bit, because you're out here in you know, June, July, and August with, with 70 degree <laughs> when cotton's a tropical plant, but we just, it was so cool. Uh, here's some visual, rep, visual representation. That's with the cover, that's no cover. It actually it was, it was 34 inches on the cover crop side, 29 inches on the not cover crop side. Uh, we go into the foliate, cover crop, and then not cover crop. Uh, so throughout the season, we saw the cover crop was far superior. I think most of that relates back to the early spring when it got such a such a better start. I think is a lot of that. But still, you look at I mean the, the cover crop side never suffered for water, obviously. So that's the not cover crop. I think it it suffered because it became later because the cotton crop got stunted. Whereas this never really hiccuped. Uh, then you get to the yield. Not great yield. I mean I've made. UA222, conventional cotton on this field, three years in a row, went over 1,500 pounds. I decided I was going to try the Americot 1511 O variety that was a phenomenal variety in the past. I just don't think it was the year for it. Uh, so, I mean, the field pit, you know, 1,200 pounds, uh, but where we did not have a cover crop is 1,034 pounds. So, uh, all the way through, we saw advantages to the cover crop. Since I went to the cover crop, and using a pipe planter. I've got pipe planter on every acre. Uh, I've cut my water usage by 50% in the last you know, five years. So what I've done, another way I've saved money using non-GMO or overseed technology. Uh, I've been between 30 and 65% non-GMO, mostly UA222. Mr. Youngman here, it's a great variety. It's been phenomenal yield-wise on my farm. Uh, so this year I was about a third non-GMO, that was about a third, $4.99 and $15.11. They were a little bit cheaper, reduced price seed, older technologies they're trying to clear out. Then I was about a third, 2,4-D, and then the newer Wide Strike 3 stuff. Uh, what got me started in the non-GMO, uh, growing Roundup and some, to some degree Liberty crops, uh, we're having to spray them off for bowl worms anyway, once, a lot of times twice. Uh, and we're having to put all the residuals out. So really the only difference between my non-GMO and my Roundup crops is I'm leaving the Roundup out when I do the <laughs> non-GMO crop. So that's why I mean, I've been consistently able to grow the non-GMO crop 60 to $80 an acre cheaper. The yield has been right there with them. And I'll show you a side here. Do you, do you kind of put them in between the GMO? I mean, like no, I, I do it in box because I don't want my spray driver to get mixed up. I do one form on GMO, one form. So, but Nathan, at one time I thought you were saying that you your rotation was optimized. So, so yeah. what I like to do and what I'm trying to get into is do like a corn and then a non-GMO for a year or two and then go into the full GMO technologies. This next year, with I'm, I'm going to be 100% 24D cotton. I'm going to take a break from non-GMO. One of the reasons is uh, I'm not growing that much corn with the price. <laughs> and I need to clean up my fields. Uh, I probably will be back into it the next year, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm cutting my cotton acres way back for a year, not way back, but back quite a bit for a year. Uh, with the Wide Strike 3 or even the new Bogard 3 when it comes out, we're not having to spray for the bow worm. It doesn't look like the prices are, are really going to increase over the what we were planting. So if you don't have to spray for bow worm and you can kill a pigweed with 2,4-D technology, 
that's what I'm going to do this next year. I might have a little bit of non-GMO, but say I'm just taking a break for a year. I, I will be back to growing some non-GMO after this next year. But I just I feel like <laughs> between I'm doing all, I, I'm really focusing. I grow non-GMO soybeans. I was about 60, 70 percent last year. I'm going to be 100 percent non-GMO soybeans next year. The problem with the non-GMO cotton is we have to make all of our savings on the front end. Right now, there's not any opportunities on the back end to make any kind of increased premium. With the beans, you get the savings on the front end, and we're getting a real good premium on the back end, and even the corn too. Uh, and I think between not having to spray the bow worms and working some of the 2,4-D technology <coughs> in, I can skip some residual applications. Like I'm going to spray a burn down with my residual, and then not probably uh, spray it behind the planter because I think our Direx is hurting us a lot too on a cold, wet year. Uh, and wait and kind of spray spray residual with the enlist one or uno whatever it is because we we can legally mix that with a with a select or something and so i can kind of combine the first three or four trips into two is kind of my plan this year so uh this is a uh we do a dr robertson and i do a, a yield trial every year kind of the 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 reason we started doing it was because a lot of times the non-GMO seeds weren't showing what I was getting on my farm. I mean, I generally beat a, a yield trial, university yield trial on my farm in a, the regular yield trial. So if, if 1518 makes 1,400 pounds in yield trial, I'm probably going to make 1,250, 1,300. But what I was seeing is the university yield trials on the non-GMOs, they were like 1,000 pounds. I was like, I'm getting, on average, you know, average in 1,250, 1,300 pounds of these. So we started doing a uh, grown under conventional conditions, uh, a trial where we kind of put the, the best, latest and greatest varieties in. Uh, UA222 has won it every year, and I don't know why this year it did not win it. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Boyd, I guess, are you going to be, uh, Mr. Young, are you going to be selling the 114? Yes. To, so Dr. Boyd and bred a new variety that he says has a more potential than the UA222. I don't know what happened there. Usually our UA222 last year, UA222 beat everything by 200 pounds in the trial. But uh, this Altex LA122, that's a conventional out of Texas, uh, Charlie Cook's variety. Uh, this is some crazy guy in Arizona, PCG713. I don't is know. Is that Michael Gilbert? Yes. Okay. The guy is nuts. Well, he starts dad, talking about the New World Order uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and just craziness. But I think so, his dad's Elmer Gilbert. Yes, yeah. yes. Red 90, so. And this, he thing. claims this variety will fruit out and then it'll start back fruiting and back setting. It does in Arizona. They I, back yeah. fruit there, but I haven't seen it in Elmer. So, I mean, it did okay and the quality was good. Uh, these are both uh, Mr. Youngman's varieties here and they did, I can't believe they beat 222, but they were, I mean, they were exactly the same. So, uh, well, they're sister lines, yes. Okay, so, uh, but you can see, I mean, we beat this is a variety that's planted a lot, and this other next gen, and you know, the 1518 was kind of the standard this year. So, this is more to show that, that, that these varieties that are out with all the genetics and everything else have generally are the, the conventionals are pretty competitive with them. Uh, so you know, that's uh. The other thing I'm trying to do, and this is, I mean, I guess what any farmer should do, but just use sound agronomic practices. Uh, like how I do my fertilize, we variable rate, we grid sample every three years. I go out and I just put my P and K out on my deficiencies. So if I don't have any deficiencies in that field, I don't touch it. If I just have three acres in the corner of a field, we'll just run that three acres and, and just put out my, my, my uh, on the deficiency. Then I'll come back after the crop's up. I usually do this after the crop's up, but then I'll come back really after it's up and put a blanket application, ammonium sulfate, urea, a crop removal of the potash, and then a boron application. Then after that, for my second shot, I come back and I variable rate my nitrogen application based on soil type. Now whether that's putting a map in or just changing it in the cab in the heavy clay, bump it up. Uh, generally what we're trying to do, I mean, Dr. Darren Dodd from Mississippi has done a lot of research on this where too high nitrogen rates in cotton, you end up spraying way more for, for bugs and it, it can cost you in yield in the end. So and we're somewhere around 90 units on lighter soils, 110 to 120 on the heavier clay. And that's all applications? Yes, that's everything, my, my total nitrogen applications. 
And, and most of the research has shown you can get a three valve plus yield with that. That's the limiting factor is not going to be nitrogen if you're putting that out. Uh, I say through my cover crop use and pipe planter. I mean that's a the, the cereal rye has been so instrumental because it does so many things in the cover crops above and beyond. So it's it's helping me reduce my tillage because I don't think I could be this no-till without the cover crop. My beds would wash down. We'd have to deep rip. There's so many things we have to do. And then going into the year, we're reducing our water usage by 50 percent in a lot of cases. I mean I went from watering every seven days like clockwork to maybe water in every 10 days. A lot of times it's 12 to 14, and this is in the heat of summer, just because you just don't see the wilt like you used to. And I, and I try to, a lot of times now, and I've always been of the opinion we were overwatering cotton in seven days. A lot of times I'm waiting until the cotton wilts, and that's where I'm making my higher yields. This year it never wilted, because it rained once a week. But, uh, say, and, and to check on irrigation, I mean, I'm starting to get in the watermark sensors, but I walk the fields with a sharpshooter. You know, if it's, if I'm thinking, man, it's, because a lot of times with these cover crops, you'll think, man, it is dry. We got to irrigate this cotton. And you'll go out there and dig, and, and man, it's wet all the way down through the soil. And you're going to hurt the crop more than you're going to help it at that point water. Uh, but I have pipe planter on every acre. So 2018, I'm taking a break for a year from non-GMO cotton. I've been very successful with it. I'm probably going to regret it. Uh, but I just, with four young kids and, National Cotton Council, Cotton Incorporated, I'm on the state FSA committee, all this other stuff I'm gone from, I'm scared to death we're gonna mess up spraying. I just, uh, I'm gonna try to do all 24D cotton for one year and, and kind of go from there. So you gonna uh, make it a difference then? Yeah. <laughs> but I've, I, like I say, I've been very happy with the non-GMO. I will be back in non-GMO production, but yes, sir. How's the, how's the germination of your non-GMO cotton? Do you have good germination on your seed or how many stalks you plant to a foot? So I, I actually, with one thing I've seen with this, with doing the cover crop, I mean you can plant cotton that deep it'll come up because you don't have any crusting. How many, how, how many stalks there? So, so I'm planting, actually with the non-GMO a lot of times because the seed's so cheap, I'll plant like 50, 55,000 planting through this cover crop. But but generally, like I'm going to do my that phytogen cotton this year at, probably 45 I think is kind of what and and I mean when I go out and check a stand if I can do this and there's a every time I put my foot down there's a plant I keep it <laughs> yeah. how do you control a pigweed post in the non-GMO guy same way I control it roundup or so I put down Valor early come back with uh, Gramoxone and Direx at planting come back pretty quick with dual and select maybe then then spray staple or invoke depending on the size if it gets big I'll put invoke out then I'll put worn out and then lay it by with capra on MSMA so invoke works for you invoke has good residual still on pigweeds it won't touch a pigweed then we're chopping it some and then I'm running Gramoxone. What I do is I got those Gramoxone hoods and we run every acre spot spraying with Gramoxone hoods. So he's driving through, he sees pigweeds, he drops it, then we'll wait a week or two and I have a chopping crew that comes through and they're, it's costing like $3 an acre to chop it off. I mean, they're just spot chopping. So I've been able to, the, the cover crop though, you, I mean, it's alleliopathic to pigweeds. You don't, you don't have the issues as bad. So, and that's one of the reasons I was letting it grow off this tall and, and it's it's a system that's worked. I've made good money doing it. Uh, I will be growing up more non-GMO in the future. It's just for one year, I'm kind of easing back. Uh, Say so the reason reason I'm doing it is take a break. I, I'm focusing more on this non-GMO soybean and corn production where I can actually get the premiums on the back end. Uh, and then the furrow rice. Uh, I, need, I really need to rotate to get rid of the pigweeds in the non-GMO fields. I just can't grow a whole bunch of corn with the price where it is. Uh, you know, by the time you plant a little bit lower seed rate than I've been planting and can combine these trips, I'm not saying I can grow the 240 cotton as cheap, but I can grow it pretty cheap. And, and it's to me, it's crucial I plant 100% because I, you know, you can push your burn down. So like I don't have to go in and try to get this burn down done in February and hire a plane to spray it all in February and March if it's too wet. I can wait till a week before I spray it and, and or a week before I plant it and spray the burn down. 
well, I guess I could spray the burn down behind the planter, you know, if we, if we start getting, because I hate an airplane. I like to do every bit of spraying myself if I can, because, I mean, the airplane is just, I've already paid, whatever, $400,000 for a spray rig. It burns me up to pay somebody else to come out and spray. So uh, I am going to kill my cover crop a little bit earlier than last year. Try to be higher, so is where I plan on doing it. So any questions? I don't know if y'all got anything out of that or not. When you're planting, like, is it just a regular planter? That you so I, pretty much, when it's smaller, I do like to run a row cleaner more to take the stalk out of the row than anything else. I went to a narrow gauge wheel just to keep it from rocking. Because, I mean, that, that bed's pretty hard. It's firm. It's actually a lot easier to get a stand because you don't have all that loose dirt. I mean, you, you're planting into a firm deal. Uh, I used a, I used a cotton closing system with the wheel in the back, packer wheel, and I went to a, they look like a disc blade that's kind of, or a, uh, sorry, look like a saw blade. And they kind of go in there between those root wads and pinch it closed more than, they don't really throw any dirt. Uh, the Schaefer rebounders, they're like $15 a row. They're kind of shaped like an upside down spoon. You put them on your seed tube, and so it, it kind of, guides those seeds if those seeds bounce out it just kind of pushes them back in that's the best thing i've done and then i the main thing that i would highly recommend is air powered have airbags for your planter down pressure or some sort of act mine's not active but you know a hydraulic or like Stephen has with the but it just the old-fashioned springs i don't you can't adjust it enough to to get what you want but so what else yeah but I mean, you don't need road cleaners. You really don't need anything. It got so big this year. <laughs> we were planting beautiful. It was, I was here, man. We were going out there. It's beautiful. We got a rain. We went back in, and that stuff had started dying on its own. It was like rope. We went from here to that wall and spent the next three hours cleaning it out and cutting. My guys finally just went and got a torch and were burning it off the road cleaners. I mean, it was just, we dropped everything off the planters, took the saw blades off, put the regular smooth this back on and went back to a factory setup with those Schaefer rebounders that's the only really thing we had and it planted fine after that but so every it's like every day is different I mean, there's a learning curve with the <laughs> cover crops but uh, so this year I'm gonna put all my stuff back on and kill it when it's a little smaller and so, so about toolbar high when it's, yeah. that's probably what I'm gonna do Adam will argue with back there he's a very high residue I think in beans and corn it's great. I'm just a little bit concerned in cotton having this high residue. There, there has not been near as much research in this in cotton. So, yeah. I keep more enjoyment out of still I'm scaring the hell out of my dad's microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I think it's <laughs> But there are definite benefits to letting it get big, and it, it just got too big on me this <laughs> year. Uh, yeah. Nathan, why do you I notice you don't use any legumes in your cover crop? Is there particular? There hasn't been a whole lot of research in cotton on that. I know the guys in Missouri ran into some issues because that stuff turned into concrete behind the planter after they planted it, and they'd kind of thrown it back over, and, and they had to replant. And I just I feel very confident in the cereal rye. Some of it I'm growing my own seed. I don't have a way to mix it. That's more money. The lagoons, when you throw them out, if you're doing like a winter pig or something, you really need to drill those rather than just sow them out and try to scratch them over. And what I'm doing is easy. It works. It's doing everything I want it to do. Yeah, it'd be great to blend. And I did do oats and rye this year, blended. Uh, but it's what's worked for me, and that's, you know, like I say, I don't have anything against the lagoon. Just I'm a little bit concerned in cotton trying to do too much get ahead of kind of the research and what we what we what we know so well any last questions for david no. excellent talk thank you very much thank really you